So uh, let's uh, let's get started again. This is a uh, another intro type class. Uh, of, so yesterday we covered a lot of admin issues. Today we will cover a lot of backgrounds of the course. We'll look at separations from different angles. Um, I will hope to convey to you why uh, it's really important that you take this course. You've obviously taken it, so it's a little bit of. Uh, we don't really need to talk about it too much. You've obviously identified that separation is something that interests you, but I will try to show you why separations are such an important uh, topic in chemical engineering. We'll look at one very simple flow sheet, sugar. So the production of sugar, and we'll look at the, the really large number of separation steps that are in that flow sheet. And uh, that's, that flow sheet and the discussion around it will be in the first assignment. So just uh, working through that in today's class already will get you some way ahead in the first assignment. And then at the end, we'll introduce some technical terminology that we will use throughout this course. So, uh, so today's class kind of is, is an intro class for all the rest of the weeks. And then from next week on, we'll start to look at various unit operations. Uh, and then I'll also discuss here in the middle uh, the feedback that I got yesterday from the forms that you guys filled in. So that's where we're heading. Um, just uh, as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned there, why study separation processes and then really important, just to put it in context, we see so many separation units around us every day. Maybe you haven't realized it or you don't see it in that perspective, but um, there's so many separators around us every day and we need to just be aware of what there are. And, uh, because they, they carry over into chemical engineering as well. Well, they're often based on chemical engineering and they have landed up in everyday use. So the main reason why we need to separate is that it doesn't happen on its own. Right? If we uh, leave nature to itself, uh, things will naturally mix. So that's what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. And we see that in many examples. If you put salt in water, it will end up dissolving into the liquid phase. Um, CO2 will disperse throughout the atmosphere if we pump it, if we ex expel it into the atmosphere. It's going to mix into the rest of the atmosphere. It's not going to partition itself into CO2 in one area and oxygen and nitrogen in another area. And so naturally, nature will take the mix. We're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to undo the second law of thermodynamics. And so every time we're doing that, we're going to have to do something to get that separation. Right? So if nature by itself will naturally mix, and we want to separate, we're going to have to put in some effort, some work, some money, some form of material, something has to be added to that overall system in order to get the separation. In and of itself, there's very few things that separate out for us. I mean, one example that does separate out for us naturally is if you take solid and you put it in a liquid phase and you just let gravity take care of the separation for you. Okay. Then you get natural separation. But then, even there I'd argue, is that you're still adding gravity. You're adding a force, except you're not paying for it. Right? So, but there's still a force taking place. There's still something being added to the system that causes that separation. If you were in a gravitational free environment, that liquid and solid wouldn't separate from itself. Okay. So nowhere really is there anywhere that we get separation that works in the way we'd like unless we put in some form of energy or some form of material. So I've highlighted these two words. We're going to give technical names to them at the end of today's class. <coughs> but the whole reason why we need to separate is because nothing happens for free for us. Um, Think about it also from this perspective. There's not always one way of separating something. Okay, so that's another reason why this course is important, is there's never one correct way or one right way of separating. So think about it and talk with the person next to you. How could you separate salt from water? Brainstorm with the person next to you at least three other different ways that you can separate salt from water. Oh, it's 
Okay, so let's uh, let's get some ideas. Some from the back over there. Okay, so evaporate the water, condense it out, and you can recover both both of them back again. So anyone else? We're back over here on this side of the class. Any ideas? Yeah. Reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis. We're going to talk about reverse osmosis in this course in four or five weeks from now, so we'll see that one. Yeah. Any other ways? Any other crazy ideas? Yeah. We can change the temperature to precipitate. Change the temperature and cause some of the salt to precipitate out. Yeah. So there's any number of ways. Um, some of them will take cost more or less energy um, or more or less complicated equipment to do it. But here there are several ways of causing the separation of salt from water. Okay, so that's, that's that reference there in King, and we'll look at least a few of those ways in this course. Now I notice a few of you are writing these notes down. That's great. Uh, just also bear in mind, obviously, that all these slides are posted on the course website, so you can download them ahead of time. The key thing I want you to take home from this is that there's multiple ways of doing it, different costs associated with different methods, different levels of complexity. And that separation, by the way, of salt from water is phenomenally important. In our lifetime, that's probably going to be the one most important separator uh, separation step that's going to impact our lives. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's another good reason to be studying separation processes. From this reference, King and Trable, um, both of those references are on the course website. They state there that 50 to 90% of the capital invested and a new flow sheet will be due to separators okay, in the petroleum industry. And that's, that's typical. If you look at a flow sheet from any one of those industries, there's one or two reactors at the front of the flow sheet. The rest of it are separation steps. At any time in most <coughs> chemical plants, 60 to 100 percent of the operating costs will be due to separators. Okay, so a phenomenal amount of our overhead budget goes to just separating, okay, and that's that whole law of thermodynamics. We won't get it happening for nothing. We need to put in a whole lot of money and efforts to get that separation happening. So most of the time in engineering, you'll be working with the separator of one form or another. Very few times will you be dealing with the reactor. Most of the times it will be the separators. Okay. Here's some other important separators that are important to our <coughs> daily lives and to the global planet, and that's carbon capture and sequestration. And not, not just carbon, but methane as well, which causes a lot of more activity on the carbon. Air pollutants, so here I'm referring specifically to solid particles and other gas particles in the air, so we're separating those out and clean access to water and sanitation. So those are three separation areas that are globally important to us. And all three of those separators are proportional in magnitude to the size of the population of the planet. So the problems associated with all those separators scale up with the number of people on the planet. So if you look back at this plot, I thought this was interesting last year, and I thought to show it again. Uh, let's just take a look at that. So when my grandmother was born, the population of the world and it was 1.5 million. When I was born in 1977, the population of the planet was somewhere around 4 point something billion. Okay, so within the ge two generations there, we've got about 3 billion people. You're over here, born in the 1990s, and then we're looking at our lifetime living in this range. So we're going to live in this range. You guys will live longer than I do. So you could either experience 13 billion or as low as 7 billion. Come back down. And either way, we're going to go up first and then come down, perhaps, if we're on the low end of the estimates. But maybe more realistically, we'll be on that orange curve. Either way, we're going to face important separation steps in our lifetime. So you're going to be responsible in your daily engineering career of looking at clean water access, carbon capture and sequestration is going to be a big role in many of the industries you work in. So these are important unit ops. And, and in fact, the feedback that you gave me on those forms yesterday indicated that many of you were interested in this already. Okay, so many of you had put water separation and carbon capture as some of the things you wanted to consider in this course. 
So those are important. So let's take a look at other separators that are around us every day. Um, so if you're making pasta at home, you, at the end of boiling the water and, and having it cook for a while, you use a sieve to strain the water and separate the water from the pasta. So that's a common, simple unit of screening. And we'll look at a little bit of that uh, next week and we'll be part of it. Absorption. You go wash your hands. Soap. You add soap. So that's a separating agent you're adding. And it's removing fats and dirt and dissolving those into the soap separating that from your skin. So there's absorption taking place. Liquid, liquid extraction, if you go soak spices or leaves or various uh, uh, garlic, for example, in oil, and you're extracting that flavor from, from, that, uh, from that leaf or from that uh, vegetable into the oil. So there's a liquid, liquid extraction <coughs> taking place over there. Here's a few others. Um, on some of the newer vacuum cleaners, there's cyclone technology. So the, the common one is the Dyson vacuum cleaner. If you go uh, click, anytime you see a link, like there in that uh, pinkish color in my slides, that's a hyperlink, you can go click on it, and there's a YouTube video associated with that. You can go see the cyclone action that's used in that vacuum cleaner. Um, other vacuum cleaners tend to use a filter. So they use a bag, so that you blow the air through the bag, and then the bag retains the, the, the Particles and the air passes through the bag. Or a furnace filter, if you changed out your furnace filter at home or your parents' home, uh, you, you know what I'm referring to over there. Making coffee or tea, you're adding tea leaves to hot water, you're leaching out that, that constituent from the leaves that you're interested in drinking into the liquid phase and then you throw away the grinds of the coffee or the tea leaves out. So there's a separation taking place there, we call that leaching. So both of those making coffee and tea is a leaching, separation, adsorption. Okay, so here's, a, here's one. You've seen these green water filters. Um, I cut it open here. Let's see if I can um, show it to you in the back of the glass. Uh, maybe you can see it a bit clearer this way. So there's the... Oh, there. So there's the, the filter, there's the insides of it, and all it is is just activated carbon. So it's very fine powdery material over here. Um, that all you do is you're passing that liquid phase through there, and it's adsorbing, AD, adsorbing the impurities onto that liquid phase. Okay, so this common filter does a lot to purify water for us, and it's also uh, used in many other chemical industries for purifying streams of oxygen and, and air. So we'll talk a bit about that near the end of the class. This is stuff actually is extremely cheap to make. So it's all, it is is just coconut shells that they just slightly burn and that's where the activation step is, so that, that's why it's called activated carbon, and then the coconut material is predominantly carbon-based. So it's activated carbon, very, very cheap, widely used in water filtration. <coughs> Centrifugation, you see when you're washing your clothes, so that spin cycle at the end to remove the water. We're going to look at centrifugation in quite some detail in this course. We'll look at other phase separations taking place near the end. So where we induce a phase change by adding heat, we see that every day in our clothes dryer, or you can induce a phase change by removing heat. That's a thing. So we've seen all these separators around us um, in our daily lives. We just see them on larger scales in the chemical industry, so in the food manufacturing industry. We also have a whole network of separators here in our body. Uh, so if we look at various organs in our body, the kidneys are separating waste from our blood all the time, and that gets reabsorbed into water, and salts get passed out. <coughs> Lungs take up CO2. The liver breaks down toxin and excretes that into the bile, which then gets discharged to the gallbladder. Uh, intestines that absorb nutrients. The spleen removes all the blood cells. All of these are filtration steps or uh, separation steps of the blood and liquids in our body, 
And then another one that's a kind of an unusual separator, but it is one, is the lymph nodes in your body are used to filter out foreign particles. And they will catch cancers and so forth. So a lot of separations, important separations, taking place in our body. A lot of chemical engineering has then gone on interfacing our human body with our external devices such as dialysis equipment. So a lot of those were invented or modified and improved by chemical engineers. So the interface between our body and medicine, you find a lot of chemical engineers going into the medical area because this good understanding that we have of chemical processes. Another interesting thing, just so that you're aware, uh, most people don't realize it, but actually of all the courses you take at MAC, there's only two courses that really are given in only chemical engineering. And that's separation processes and reactor design. Every other course you take, you can take in another department. <coughs> yeah, so you can take process control in another department. You can take engineering and economics in another department. Process modeling from 3E, you can take in another department. But only, and fluid flow and heat transport, obviously. Only separation processes and reactor design, those are two unique chemical engineering courses that you don't find in other departments. So that would, kind of separates chemical engineers from the rest of the engineers, if you want to see it in that way. That's another reason why this course is, is, is given in our department. So what I'd like you to do here in this video that I'm going to look at next is it will probably be a little bit eye-opening in a way. If you never realized how sugar was produced, this will be interesting for you. But what I want you to do while the video is playing uh, this is going to be in the assignment where you're going to look at the flow sheet for the sugar production and identify all the separators that they talk about in the video. So you should be able to at least identify at least a good five and maybe even ten separators. Okay, so as the video is going, uh, pay attention to that and, and take note of it. It's, all, it's also going to be the first assignment question. So let's, uh, let's take a look here. Next time you reach for the sugar bowl, try to imagine that it was once so rare and expensive, it was called white gold. Producing sugar from the sugar cane first took place in India. About 300 BC, Alexander the Great's army reported seeing a reed that gives honey without bees growing there. This table sugar has many names. Mill white, plantation white, and crystal sugar, but it all comes from the sugar cane. It looks a lot like bamboo, with fully grown stalks that can measure up to 6 meters high. Here in the field, a worker pairs away the husk from a stalk of sugar cane, then chews the cane's raw pulp to extract the stalk's sweet juice. This machine harvests the cane by cutting it at the base. Rotating scrolls feed the cane to the chopper drums inside. As they chop the cane, a fan blows the lighter leaves and tops back onto the field. The heavier lengths of cane drop into the base of a conveyor, which feeds them into the transport bin that follows alongside. rapidly transport the cut cane to the sugar mill for processing. Once cut, sugar cane begins to lose its sugar content, and damage to the cane during harvesting accelerates this decay. At the mill, trucks empty their load onto a receiving table. It feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes. must be as clean as possible before extracting the juice. But first, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. 
large cylinders compress the cane fiber. The juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse, the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before turning the juice into sugar crystals, a sample goes through a series of tests at the sugar mill's laboratory. First, a technician adds a thickener that binds to impurities in the juice, and then filters it to obtain a clear, clean juice. Then, he pours it into a polarimeter, a machine that measures the concentration of sugar. The juice from the mills now falls through this 10 meter high tower as sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This process, known as sulfitation, bleaches the juice. Then the juice flows through a device that measures its pH level. While at a separate vat, workers add powdered lime to water, preparing a solution to which they will then add the juice. An agitator mixes the cane juice and lime solution for about six hours to complete a process called alkalization. regulates the juice's pH level and helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over two hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom while the clarified juice collects at the top. Next, we'll see how this clarified juice transforms into flowing crystals of white sugar. Workers filter the residue, known as mud. There's no waste here. The mud will fertilize the cane fields, and the bagasse will be burned as fuel. Clarified juice collected from the clarifier tanks now boils in a series of evaporators. This brings the concentration of the sugar in the juice up from 15% to 60%. Then the juice collects in 15 ton tanks to clarify even more. Any sediment left in the juice floats to the top. A rotating paddle skims this residue off to the sides of the tank. Tanks produce a type of syrup that goes on for still more processing. Workers now pour microscopic sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. This milky solution binds to the sugar present in the syrup and helps draw it out. Next, it all boils in large vacuum pans, forming sugar crystals. As the water in the syrup boils away, Workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquit. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine, while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so that only the crystals remain. This centrifuge works much the same way as a washing machine set on a spin cycle. It draws out moisture from the sugar, much like you draw out the wash water from a load of laundry.
Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. This mill produces raw sugar, which has a high molasses color and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. The sugar on the conveyor now goes into a large dryer. Hot air blows into this dryer to bring the sugar's humidity level down to 0.02%. That's standard for table sugar. The dried sugar pours out of the dryer into a bag on a scale. It's full when it weighs in at 1,000 kilos. A hoist then carries the bags to a platform at the far end of the packing facility. At 3,000 kilos, that's a heavy load. It lowers each bag over a chute that leads to the factory's main floor. Workers carefully open each bag in turn and pour out the sugar directly into the chute. It feeds an automated packaging machine which fills a series of two kilo plastic bags, seals them and separates them. This packing facility produces 200,000 bags a day. That means processing 400 tons of white sugar daily. This fine plantation white sugar, sugar is available in a variety of <coughs> The smaller mills in Hawaii will process up to 3 billion kilos a day of sugar. So it's a, a lot of sugar, a lot of interesting unit ops in that flow sheet, right? So it's, um, if you take a look at it, and, you, and you'll see these flow sheets in the first assignment, where you, you probably picked up, as most of you did, before you were writing down in the video, that separation step up at the front of separating out uh, and then harvesting it and then we're going into the mill. That crushing step isn't really a separator, but then here we separate the pulp. That juice then comes through, we're adding lime. Clarification step at there, the settling that happened is the evaporators, the filters that you saw. We're going to look at the filters in, in two, three weeks from now. You saw the guy adding a little bit of that white liquid in into the crystallizer to initiate the crystallization process, and then the centrifuges. And then that's the first half of the flow sheet. The next half over here is um, where you start to take it, that, look, that sugar that's like around 97% pure, and you take it up to a very, very high purity at the end, where we did the filtration step there, um, a lot of Sulfur dioxide and hydrochloric acid are added there in the lower tanks. Um, filtration followed by that and then the drying at the end of the regulation. So all of these steps, we're going to see um, most of them, I'd say, in this course. Uh, but here it's, it's, a, it's a very neat example because it's also integrated into one single flow sheet. So if you notice there, very very little is added, so we start off with the sugar cane, and, and all it is is just a series of separators after that. The only things that are added are added to create the separation. So they add bleach for the bleaching, the bleaching agents to remove the color, for example. And the calcium was added there to initiate precipitation of purity. So the only additives are additives to create separation steps. So. a nice integrated example. Let's talk a bit about some of the things that you guys want to see covered in this course. Uh, here they are from highest to lowest. So a lot of feedback regarding distillation, rectification, flash drums, divided wall columns, they all kind of fall into the same category. Next up was membranes, <coughs> including reverse osmosis, filtration, various types, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration. Uh, Several groups wanted to look at different options of water treatments, and when they mentioned the types of unit ops, there were filtration and membranes up there. So a lot of concentration, um, a lot of interest actually on, on that topic, which is good to see. Centrifuges, carbon capture, crystallization, which we saw here in the sugar video, photography, uh, gas solid liquid scrubbing, so separating solids from gas or liquids from gas, flotation, liquid liquid extraction, and 
the static precipitation. So it's interesting, very similar to the uh, group last year. Um, this year, the only difference was that distillation and membrane switched places. So a little bit more interest in distillation than there was last year. Now, I will say, unfortunately, that though distillation is right at the top, I don't cover it in this course at all. And there's a simple <laughs> reason for it. It's because you've seen it mostly in 3M. Right? So if we recap it, it's a bit of a wasted, it's a duplication, really. I'd rather spend a lot more time exposing to a whole variety of other separators. Furthermore, distillation is in and of itself a whole course. Right? If we look at distillation, the topic of it, in many years, in different universities, they teach it as its own course. There's entire thick textbooks written just on the topic. So even if I covered it for two weeks, I still wouldn't be doing the topic justice in this course. So I'd rather focus on all those other topics and cover them. And we can get into some detail on those. But distillation is one of those, firstly, you have seen already. And it's also a topic that's just too big for an elective. So I will omit that, but we will, we will pay attention to all the others, though. Um, there's a certain way I've structured the course, and I'll follow that again from last year, is we're going to look at all those separators. Separation systems tend to classify them either as solid versus fluid separators. So by fluids, we mean liquids and or gases. It bumps up into that term fluid. So you often see solid fluid separations to refer to solid liquid or solid gas. We will cover unit operations of various types. So we'll look at unit ops that only use mechanical techniques to separate. Then we'll look at mass transfer separations. Then we'll look at phase creation or addition and then heat transfer. So let's take a look at that diagrammatically. So here's our course over here. We're going to start with mechanical separations. So sedimentation is the first one we're going to look at next week. That uses mechanical force, gravity, to separate thickeners and clarifiers fall form into that same category. Then we'll look at screens. So the screening we saw there in the video, um, and it's, it's an easy topic to understand, so we'll spend at most one class on that. Uh, centrifuges and cyclones we'll spend a bit more time on. So they were applying a force that we create to centrifugal motion. Um, and cyclones is also a force that's created and added to the system to, to achieve the separation. Electrophoresis and magnetic fields, uh, I'll touch on briefly on those. But again, here you're applying a magnetic field on, uh, to create separation. And then we'll move on to where we're adding a physical barrier to create the separation. So filters and membranes. And really under that topic of membranes, we'll look at microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and reverse osmosis. So those three really fall as a subset under membranes. But we'll first look at just conventional filters first, because the same theory from filtration applies to membranes as well. Membranes are really nothing more than just a sophisticated filter, if you want to look at it crudely. Then we'll look at uh, mass transfer-based separations for about two weeks. Uh, the one in particular we'll pay attention to is liquid-liquid, or solvent extraction, as it's sometimes called. Supercritical fluid extraction crystallization, I'll have readings on those two for you to go through, but we won't cover them in the teaching side of the course. Solid fluid separations that take place in a column We'll look at adsorption quite strongly, and then ion exchange and chromatography will feature in the project as one of the choices, as well as some readings on that. So those are important water-based separations. So uh, in the field of water treatment, ion exchange is phenomenally important. For those of you that are interested in drugs and drug separations, bioprocessing, chromatography is a huge, huge deal. So, a lot, a lot of chromatography we associate with bench top scale, but there is a big component of uh, chromatography that's used in large scale separators. So again, then that may be a project choice and, and some readings on that. And then finally we'll end of course with the heat based uh, separations, especially those where we're inducing a phase creep. Uh, so in evaporation and drying, we're creating new phases to, to cause the separation. Um, crystallization is a topic that, that I don't think we'll have time for um, in, the, in this course. And then distillation, as I've already mentioned, is too complex for, 
for the uh, 12, 13 weeks that we have. Okay, so that's how I see the course uh, structured in terms of those aspects. So mechanical forces are really some of the simpler unit ops to, to study, and there's a number of important concepts that start over there and then get used in these others. So that's the reason for me starting over at that top right corner and then moving around. What I find totally counterintuitive is most separation textbooks start up there with evaporation and drying and work the other way around. It gets simpler and simpler. I don't get it. So uh, we'll start to introduce a lot of the, the simple physical forces that we deal with and then get more and more complex towards the end of the term. Any questions on that or any comments so far? Okay. Next up is just to, for those of you that are on the bio stream, you've taken free PM and uh, seen and heard of bio separation. Just to put that in context with this course, is there's a lot of overlap. Except in the bio area, they often don't call it separation, they just call it downstream processing. So anything downstream from the bioreactor is, is usually a separator of some sort. The only other major difference is that in the bio industry, they will operate those at temperatures, pressures, pH, and with aqueous media that are that accommodate the bioculture that you're, you're working with. Right? So, so we work in clean rooms at ambient temperatures, moderate pressures, typical ambient uh, mid-range mid pHs, and typically in aqueous environment. So chemical engineers are good bioengineers right? because we understand separations from a broad perspective. In bioengineering, we tend to then take that knowledge and focus it down to ambient temperatures, pressures, and moderate conditions for the cellular structures to survive in. Um, these unit ops that are typically seen in a bioseparation flow sheet will also cover some of it. So centrifugation you will often see in a bio flow sheet. We'll look at it here in this course. We'll look at adsorption. We'll look at filtration and membranes as well in, in a lot of them. So uh, for those of you that are interested in the bio field, there's a lot of overlap with this course and 3DM and some of your other interests that you have. Now, when we look at units in this course, my approach is as follows. I will always introduce the units. I'll show you a few diagrams and pictures about it. I'll talk about where it's used. We'll discuss the physical principle underlying the separation. So we're not going to cover, say, magnetic separation. But if we were to, we would look at the magnetic fields and, and understand that that's the principle behind which the separation occurs. We'll look at where it be applied in practice. We'll then go on to look at concepts on sizing the unit and scaling it up, but not too much time on that. My interest is far more on these lower topics where we look at problems with the units. How would you use the units to operate in a different environment? So your boss is asking you to take this unit that you already have and now make it work for a slightly different feed combination or you want to increase the throughput through that unit, what's going to be the result? And you, will that existing unit accommodate a higher through, throughput? Will it accommodate a larger or smaller particle size coming in that you normally uh, would have had? Uh, so in, in a sense, what you're doing is you're modifying an existing unit and trying to repurpose it. We do a lot more of this as engineers than that, designing <coughs> processes. Almost as I said in 4N this morning, for those of you taking both classes, we seldom design processes. We're more often than not, we're troubleshooting and dealing with existing processes. So that's my focus with this course as well, is how you optimize an existing unit, make it use less energy, make become more efficient, uh, troubleshoot problems with the units, and so forth. So we're, we will look at the equations and the concepts to size the unit, because those come into play when we need to troubleshoot the unit. Right? If you know how the unit was sized originally, then when you need to operate the unit at higher throughput, you can then start to understand what the trade-offs are. But you need to understand how the unit was designed initially and what the equations and physical principles are for that unit if you want to start to modify it. So that's how I will look at each unit off. Um, now I'd like you to take a few minutes uh, and 
only deal with the, the lower left triangle here. So this block, this block, this block, and these three over here. So these bottom six in the lower left triangle. And for each of those, consider a unit operation. So talk to the person next to you and discover and talk about what unit op would be separating liquid. So let's take this block as an example. Liquid is in the, in the majority of the phase. So you've got more liquid separating a lot of liquid from a little bit of solid. What would be an appropriate unit operation to use here? If you were in this block, you'd be separating a lot of vapor phase from a small amount of solid phase. What, what would be an appropriate unit operation to use here? Okay, so for these six blocks, talk with the person next to you and in two, three minutes, just write down the names of the units that you would think would be suitable. separate a lot of vapor phase from some solids. Cyclone, right? Any other options that you could use? The 
HEPA filter is a great example. Yeah. So to just take a little bit of residual solid or dust out of the vapor phase would be a good example. Now, how would you separate a lot of liquid from solid? Sedimentation. Sedimentation. You could use a cyclone there as well for that. You could use a filter media. So there's, a, there's quite a variety of options. Actually, that, that block is probably the one that you can fill the most options in. It's liquid from solid. It happens so, so frequently. And there's many different options for that. Solid from solid. A screen or a mesh, depending on the different particle sizes. You're right. Yeah. You could manually sort. <laughs> If you're desperate. Magnetic separation is a good example of solid solid separation. So you're exploiting that aspect of the material. So this is just one way to look at separators is the phases involved. The next way you can look at separators is looking at the physical property that you're exploiting to separate material. Okay, so we're going to start to see that in some of our classes coming up. Uh, is what is the physical property that's being exploited to create the separation or cause the separation. What I'd like you to consider next is this new terminology. So um, in purple, when I'm introducing new terminology, it's up there as a definition. We're talking about separating agents. So here we've got two types of separating agents to deal with, ESAs and MSAs. So a mass separating agent and an energy separating agent. So if I'm adding heat to a system, that's an energy separating agent. If I'm adding a liquid solvent that will preferentially take one component up over the other, that's a mass separating agent. If I'm applying a pressure, so I'm forcing material through a filter bed, the pressure I'm applying is an energy separating agent. But the filter cloth that I'm using is a mass separating agent. Okay. So there's two agents that are used in filtration. There's the pressure I'm applying, and then there's the filter bed itself that's holding the material back while the other material passes through. So there's mass separating agents and energy separating agents. Work through this list here and determine which one's an ESA and which one's an MSA. assignments is that the sugar flow sheet is identify what the ESAs and MSAs are. The next thing I want you to be aware of as a technical term is the separation factor. So here's our first equation in the course and it's the one that we're going to use all the time. The separation factor is defined as the ratio of those, those numbers, x and the subscripts. Now x's can be flow rates, they can be mass fractions, there can be mole fractions, so mass fractions, mole fractions, flow rates, and they can be whatever units you like them to be. Obviously the mole fractions and mass fractions are dimensionless, but if they were flow rates, then you can pick whatever units, as long as they're consistent, because they all will cancel out. So Sij is dimensionless. So the separation factor has no units, as long as you're consistent with what's on the right hand side. Now, here's the part that tricks people up. The definition for SIJ gives you a lot of freedom. What is one? What is two? What is I? What is J? 
So I and J are the species you separate. So let's say a liquid from a solid. You, you assign liquid to I and solid to J. And then whatever your choice is, <coughs> you choose those so that SIJ is greater than 1. You can always choose it so it's less than 1. But you need to choose I and J, the species, so that SIJ is, is greater than 1. <coughs> Now here's what I'd like you to think over the weekend and for the class back on Tuesday. For a process where I'm getting really good separation, so let's say a liquid from a solid, very easy to separate liquid from solid, SIJ is going to be a large positive number. Okay, That's here. We can see solid fluid separations always have high separation factors. Go plug in some numbers into those x's. Hypothetical values. For a good separator, so xi1, xj1, which one is going to be a high value, which one is going to be a small value? So plug in some hypothetical numbers and prove to yourself that no matter how you pick stream 1 versus 2, so whether your solids leave in stream 2 or whether your solids leave in stream 1, sij will still be there. Okay? So go prove that to yourself. The work of that equation with a number of examples, we're going to see this over and over. You must be very comfortable with this. Okay.